may be seated. As we finish up our sermon series on uh, Jesus' greatest hits, I don't mean to say that we won't be looking for Jesus' greatest hits after this, but uh, we, we're, we're in the Gospel of Matthew right now, and we're coming on a, a passage of Scripture that is probably fairly well known to a lot of us. It says, Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How many could use a little reassurance, a little rest, a little certainty that God's got this in this crazy, crazy world? Well, what we're going to look at is what Jesus says about how to find that assurance, how to find that rest. And a word that, that comes to mind is the word misdiagnosis. What, is, what does the word misdi- what does misdiagnosis mean? It's wrong. It is looked at the wrong symptoms or come to the wrong conclusions or about the symptoms, and therefore it gives a medicine that isn't going to bring a cure. That's misdiagnosis, right? Okay. What Jesus is dealing with here is, is Israel's misdiagnosis of the problem and the cure. And he's trying to get them past what they think they know, and especially those people that think they know what they know. And he's talking about how dangerous it is to think you got it all figured out. And he's saying, this is the problem, this I am the cure. So listen to what happens here. We'll be looking at a few verses before, a few verses after, and so on, as we try to do that. But we're now at the 25th verse, of chapter 11 of Matthew. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have what? Well, no wonder. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let's try that again. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, the people that figure they know what they know and they don't need to know anything more. Okay, You have hidden them from the wise and learned. Their wisdom has not produced what you want to reveal to them. And instead you've revealed them to little children. Now does he, does he mean just little ones? Those who come to him as a child, using their example. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me. This is Jesus talking. All things have been committed to me by my Father, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal. So what's a big part about the the diagnosis and cure? Revealing who the Father is so we connect with Him. Now, who said they're a little tired, a little frustrated, a little worn out? Anybody? This is for you that will hear it. And this especially for you that don't know you need it. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and in me you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. God, this is all about believing you have the best for us. Understanding that every one of us at times struggles to embrace that. Sometimes we choose to keep the wrapper on the candy. Help us not to do that, God whether this is for a person that needs salvation and it's coming to Jesus in order to be saved by his death and resurrection, whether this is for a person that their daily walk needs more of the taste of Jesus so that they may have the fragrance of God in their life. Whatever it is, God, it works for every person. Let us remove the candy wrapper that we may have more and more and more of you that we may find the absolute assurance of who you are leading our lives so that we can keep becoming what we're supposed to become. That's walking with you. 
It's always becoming more of what we should become. Help us with this, please. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And may all God's people say, Amen. So what's been going on before this is Jesus was talking to the people. He was talking to a crowd again. And every time he's talking to a crowd, you know who they're exactly like? Us. They're exactly like us. He's talking to a crowd again, and there's some lead-ins that come to this come unto me stuff. He first talks to them about John the Baptist. So he's talking to common people, but there's religious people out there also, whispering and protesting. He talks to them first about John the Baptist. He talks about John had a pure message to share with the people. God wanted us to be connected with the people. John talked to us about repentance. Repentance means stopping, turning around, changing. And yet the religious people rejected John. They didn't want to listen to him. And Herod ends up cutting off his head. So he first talks about John the Baptist and the value of what John is. The next thing he says then is this this illustration, this idea of these little children. And what is Jesus always doing with the little children? He's picking them up, he's loving them, and he's saying this is a spiritual lesson. As a child comes to him, Jesus, trusting him, seeking him, Wanting to be in his life, how should we come to God? Like a child, wanting him, seeking him, wanting him to be in our life, taking the candy wrapper off. And then after he's given that kind of correction and this positive illustration about children, then he says something meant to really get their attention. And he's not trying to irritate them, he's trying to get them to change. He's trying to get them to, this is a problem, isn't it? Holding on to stuff, holding on to the stuff we want. I keep saying this because this is the best illustration I can think of this month. It's about not holding on to my stuff, but saying, God, help me. Because I can't receive from you if I do this. And sometimes I don't want to do this. So I need you to help me. Let go. Bitterness, gossip, unforgiveness, temptation, worry. It's all there. And so... He then talks, and let's see this first one. Our map is up here. He's talking about a few different cities, and when we understand the geography, we understand more the message of what he's saying here. So he first talks about this city, Chorazin, and this city, Bethsaida. And as you can see, they are on this body of water. Anybody know what that body of water is called? Sea of Galilee. Jesus spends the large majority of his ministry up here on the Sea of Galilee, and he's around these towns. He particularly spends a lot of time in Capernaum. And he's preaching to these folks, and he's talking to these folks, and he's encouraging these folks, and he's begging these folks. But some of these folks, you know what they're still doing? This. They still got the candy wrapper on the Smarties. They're not getting it, and they won't let go. And so he says to these people a shocking lesson. He says, I've been preaching to you, I've been talking to you, I've been calling to you, and yet you're still doing this. I tell you the truth, that if Sidon and Tyre, Sidon and Tyre are up here in this place called Syrophoenicia. The Syrophoenicians, it's really kind of hard to get a sense of the ethnic quality of these folks, um, probably descendants from Canaanites. What we know for sure is they're not, starts with a J and rhymes with Uish. They're not what? They're not Jewish. So how do these people tend to look at people that weren't Jewish? Didn't want to be around them. Saw them as spiritually lesser. But Jesus is trying to get their attention. And so he says, if I'm up here preaching in Sidon and Tyre with the Syrophoenicians, they would have repented long ago. They would have grabbed on to the message, seeing that the good news is good. Where is your heart? And then if that's not enough, he talks about, anybody heard of Sodom? That's That's a bad city, isn't it? But had he been there, they would have repented. Why aren't you repenting at what you have heard and what you have seen? And the message that was good and the question that was solid 2,000 years ago, you know what it comes right back to us today, doesn't it? Why is the candy wrapper still in the candy? God has done everything he can to show you the sweetness of his love, his mercy, and his guidance in your life. Why do you keep the wrapper on? We go from there. Jesus says, 
God has keeping this crypto is the main word here for hidden. When we, when we think of an English word that's related to crypto, what if, what do we, what's a word? Cryptic? Cryptic? Yeah, anybody? Everybody wake out there? Cryptic? God has kept this thing hidden from two kinds of people. Those that believe they got it. Those that believe they know. Those that believe they don't have to pull the candy wrapper off the candy because they're smart enough to have this all figured out. One of the most dangerous things the Bible keeps pointing out to all of us is don't think you're that smart and don't know that you don't know what you don't know. Does that make sense? Because that builds walls between us and God. That keeps the wrapper on the candy. So he's saying God has hidden this. He's kept it cryptic from those that believe they're wise and learned. Not because he didn't want them to know, but because they refused to see. So it makes no sense to them. There's no real connection there. And he says, but he has chosen to apocalypto. Get the word apocalypse. He has chosen to reveal it to who? And those that come like children. Those that recognize sometimes I don't want what you want. I don't love what you love. And I'm, I'm the problem there because it's my selfishness. It's my thinking I'm so smart. It's me thinking I got it figured out. It's me tempted to think I'm better than you. All that stuff is layered stuff that gets in the way. It's me thinking if I only had a bigger camper, I'd be happy in life. All that stuff gets in the way. He hides it from the wise and learned, and he reveals it to those that come with hearts that want to discover. Those that know that candy tastes so good, and I want the wrapper off, I want Jesus. And then he says, for all things have been given to the Christ. Now, can you imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees in that group, and they're hearing Jesus say, all things are coming through me. Can you imagine what they're thinking? They're tightening up their fists, and they're becoming the wise and the learned all the more. And they're missing it. He then talks about that incom incomparable relationship between the Father knows the Son and the Son knows the Father, and the Father is revealed by the Son. Again, the religious people would have, oh. And then after he's challenged them, and he's gotten them thinking about who are we really? Do we live in a world that's messed up? Do we live a life where we have anxieties and worries? Sometimes we don't have enough money, and sometimes we've got enough money, but we don't have good health. Sometimes our marriages aren't quite what we thought they would be or hoped they would be. Sometimes job situations, they can come and they can go. Sometimes our children are living something that we wish they weren't. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we have tried so hard to be good, and it's so hard to be good. Anybody know? And he says this. He says this to everyone who's on the edge of their seat right now with anxiety or guilt or shame or worry or chasing some other thing. He says this. Come unto me, all, Jews, Gentiles, Romans, Greeks, Syrophoenicians, Samaritans. Who is, who is the gospel for? Come unto me, all. Does that mean, is anybody in here so guilty from their past that they can't come unto Jesus? What is he saying? He's saying, no, exactly, I want to deal with the guilt and the shame from the past. I want to feel, deal with the weaknesses you're feeling right now, the uncertainty you're feeling right now. Come unto me, all who labor, they're weary, and they're heavy laden. There is a, a, a load bearing upon them everything from health to spiritual things, to marriages, to jobs. Come unto me, everybody that walks like this. And I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you. Now, who knows what a yoke is? Who's got a, anybody got farming background in here? Okay, I'm a city boy. And this is no yoke. Um, I'm a city boy. Couldn't resist, can't help myself. As we know, uh, a yoke on a farm, it's this device that helps with animals that are beasts of burden, and it, what, it, it's like a weight distributor on a camper. It distributes the weight better so it's easier and organized, and then they pull together to move, okay? So when we as, as Gentile Christians, when we hear this, this idea, take my yoke, we hear that thing, the, the leading and him carrying the weight and so on, and it's a good thing. To Jewish people, they would have had still the agricultural picture, but they would have had another thing that would have just hit it home when he says, my yoke. You see, there, were, there was the yoke of the law. And with the yoke of the law was all this man-made stuff that I believe came out of good intention and it got really messed up. This man-made stuff, 613 regulations upon the law that God already gave, and the law is good because it tells us the way we should go and it convicts us of those weaknesses, but they would added on top of it 613 other burdens, and, and, and it made, came natural. What does it mean if I shouldn't work on the Sabbath? What, what does it mean to do what? Work. What is work? How far can I walk? How much can I lift? Can I take an animal out of a pit? And so these 613 regulations began to be piled upon people's lives and their back and their shoulders, and they began to be oppressed by these things, knowing that they could not do the things that the law required, and then even something worse happened. Some of the religious people got really, ooh, look at me. And if I can have you look at Ron's sins, and if I can point out Ron's sins, you're likely not going to see what? My sins. And then, then I don't deal with them because I'm hiding them, but we'll, we'll worry about Ron. And so the yoke was being used as a weapon of oppression upon people. So when Jesus says, take my yoke, it's not only this thing that goes on the animal, but it's he is the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment of the commands. He is the one that gives us direction for life. And the direction he wants to give us is given to set us free from the power of sin and death and the labor that is before us. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and, and do what from me? What does he say? Learn from me. It's a word that means disciple. Disciple is someone who learns so that they can follow. Does that make sense? It's an ongoing thing. Keep on learning, keep on following, keep on letting him help correct course. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, increase in knowledge. For my yoke is what? It's easy. It'll, it'll bring management into your life because I'm doing the heavy lifting. You keep talking to me and keep entrusting me, and I'm going to do the heavy lifting. And even when you honestly say to me, Lord, I do not want to forget that, forgive that person for what they've done for me, and I don't want to, and you know the toxic stuff's got you. He'll first say, do you trust me? Let's do this together. And he'll set you free. And that's true for anything you're fighting with in life right now. Take his yoke upon you to manage that thing, those things that you're struggling with. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once again, this is all about surrender to him. Let him make life manageable and learn from him what he does and with his help, imitate it. Does that make sense? And we get these lessons over and over, this, this reminder over and over again, bring your struggles, bring your hurt, bring your worry to him, and he will help. Now, one last thing about the misdiagnosis part. We have something built inside of us that wants hope, that wants peace, that wants joy. But the problem with misdiagnosis is the world keeps offering us pyrite. What's pyrite? Fool's gold. Fool's gold. 
The world keeps offering us all these other things with the promise that they're going to give us peace and joy and hope. And as long as we're fooled by those things, it keeps the wrapper on the candy and it's tough to taste Jesus. A guy by the name of Randy Alcorn writes a lot of books about heaven. He said the following quote I'm going to share with you right now. That in order to come to Jesus, there's things that have to be let go of in order to follow. Randy Alcorn says this, Nothing is more often misdiagnosed than our homesickness for heaven. We have a deep desire to be in a place that's just. We have a deep desire to be in a place where we're repaired. We have a deep desire to be in a place where there's reunion. We have a deep desire to be restored. Everybody has it. Nothing is more often misdiagnosed than our homesickness for heaven. We think that what we want is pyrite, sex, drugs, alcohol, a new job, a raise. If only I get that raise, everything will be great. A doctorate, if only I get my education, everything's going to be wonderful. A spouse, if only I had the right spouse or a different one than I have now. Large screen TV, a new car. Boy, how fast does that new car smell fade? A cabin in the woods where I can go enjoy nature and skip church. A condo in Hawaii. Wouldn't turn it down, but, you know. <laughs> Pyrite. What we really want is the person we were made for. Who is it? Come unto me. What we really want is the person we were made for and the place we were made for, heaven. Nothing less can satisfy us. Everything else will keep the weight piling on. The labor overwhelming, the worry, horrible. Hopelessness. The world models it all the time. So Jesus is saying, if you know you need something better to set you free. What? Come unto me. And if you don't yet recognize that you need something to set you free, this is especially for you. The fool's gold will not work. And he says to you, to you, come unto me. my hands. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being so wonderful, so loving, so caring, that you want to be connected to lives so that you can save people and that you can give hope, you can give assurance and that you can lead lives because you will lead us to the right stuff. You will lead us in order to help us to become what we're supposed to become and in that we will find the joy and the hope and the assurance and the peace and the forgiveness that our hearts were made to search for. Help us, Lord, even with this, to say yes to you. Help us. This we ask and this we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. We're going to close with an old hymn.